scattered out here. Let's go, um, let's go one at a time with this to start. <clears throat> we might all start working together, but let's go one at a time. So here's what we're gonna do, riders. You're gonna use all these poles. If you're riding around in the trot, or those of you with gated horses, you can get your medium gait going. And you're just gonna ride across. Now, why are we crossing the pole obliquely? I started doing this a lot after studying uh, uh, equine rehabilitation uh, exercises with horses because it stimulates the, horse, the, the muscles under the horse's scapula because the horse has to step out away from his body with his scapula uh, the changes that you get from that from interrupting his uh, crossing the pole just with inertia which is what he does when he goes straight across I started to see the changes that came about from that so this is a way that I like to remind riders you can and should ride across poles. It is very beneficial to ride straight across them for sure. We're going to do some of that in a second. But riding obliquely across poles, whether or not they're raised, is really useful. Now one of the things that we're looking for as we just watch Crystal going around the poles is whether or not the horse always organizes his strides to cross with the same limb. Sometimes you'll see horses do that if they're very side dominant. They'll kind of reshuffle their steps as they approach the pole, so they're always crossing with the right, for example. Um, so far, I don't see that with Crystal's horse. You see, he's pretty willing to go both ways. But what do we do see with Crystal's horse? Did you notice as you went over all those poles, the top line got softer and softer and softer? You're probably thinking about other stuff. Maybe you didn't even notice that happened, but that was so lovely. It was like a, just a poof, a change in your horse. It's really nice. Let's let him take a break. Uh, Emma, are you ready to give that a go? Is it pretty clear what we're doing? Just have at it, go over the poles, uh, keep a real steady rhythm. Make sure you are crossing every pole at an oblique angle, especially for horses that have done a fair bit of pole work. Sometimes initially they're like, these poles, you want to just get one step between these poles. I don't want to see the horse shuffle an extra step. These are set at about three feet for an average good ground covering walk step. Uh, if you were on something like a Tennessee walker, you might set them closer to three and a half feet. Um, the three feet is pretty good for the average horse walking. Then you're going to pick up a jog right here in the middle of this blank space, and you're going to trot over these poles. And again, I want just one step, okay? These poles are spaced at about four feet. That's where I start for an average trot stride. I'm going to adjust them as we go based on how these horses are doing with that. For gated horses, I would set these at nine feet. So you would have your walk poles, and then you would set these at nine feet. So that's a, <clears throat> a distance that does not break up your gait, typically, but you're still getting the same gymnastic benefit. So riders, um, we can all do this one at a time after the next. Um, since you're down on that end, Emma, why don't you lead us off? We will do it in both directions, but we're going to start coming this way. So we're starting with the walk over those poles, right over the middle. Then you're going to transition to your jog and trot over these two poles here. And then just move around and you're going to repeat it. So the, the value in, uh, as you've heard me say all weekend, in crossing over poles, whether it's walking or trotting, is it measures, we got a little crooked there. On the, were we drifting to the right? It looked like we were drifting to the right from this angle, were we? Yeah, I know we were drifting everywhere. Okay, okay. Um, the value in going over poles is that it measures the horse's stride. So the horse is not, the horse has, so riders, Lexi and Crystal, you can go ahead and turn the rider against pattern. The horse has, like us, it has central pattern generators, which is that the horse can, once it's learned a movement, let's say you're working gait, you're working trot, once it learns that, that rhythm in the nervous system, it generates that movement without any brain involvement. It generates that movement of signals coming from the spine. That's good in that it makes it efficient. It's bad in the sense that when there's a movement you want to change or improve, you need to get the neurosynapses firing from the brain down into the nervous system, into the limbs, into the body, the, the muscular skeletal system. To do that, we need to give the horse exercises where he's not just firing from those central pattern generators, he's not just robotically using the rhythms that he knows in his body. So ground poles do that for us. Ground poles connect the brain and the rest of the body because they 
measure out the strides in a way that interrupts his regular pop 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 moving along, if that makes sense. Uh, that's good, Lexi. Really good. A little bit crooked, but nice rhythm. Okay, really good rhythm. Okay, look up and still. Yeah, there you go. One, two, one, two, one, two. Not bad. Drifting to the right again, though, huh? I think that's our theme today for this one. <laughs> Okay, so straight over the walk pole, straight, 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 and trot. Bump, 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 bump. I'm gonna make these just a little bit wider for these horses. They're all doing pretty well. And kind of, if they're bumping the poles, generally they're too close together. Okay, go ahead, come on up. So what you're all looking for from the audience is when they go from the walk to the trot, do they do that? Smoothly, or is there like a lift and neck? Does the horse jolt his neck up? Does it get really crooked, like swinging around, fish tailing? Yeah, good. And if the horse lifts his neck up again, I'm not asking these riders to try to prevent that. I'm not trying to hold the neck down by any No, Hey, that was straight. Okay, do you know why that was so good, Crystal? Because she was straighter, right? That movement was so much like she was fluid. It was lift and rigid. Because she's driving equally on both hind legs. Or he, he, I'm so sorry. When the horse is crooked, it's like I got my thumb on one end of the garden hose and it's like squirting out to the side, right? When the horse is using both hind legs equally, oh, then good things start to happen. We're going to go for one more time in this direction, and then we're going to reverse it so you're making this downward transition after your trot pulls. A little bit trickier that way. That's okay. Real beautiful in the first three pulls, and then she went, I don't think I'm gonna maintain this push from my hind end and add in another step, okay? No big deal. She's capable of this spacing. This is a little bit wider than four feet. She's capable of it, but it might it might not come consistently yet. Good, and drop. Okay, so riders, I'm gonna go ahead and have you reverse so that this time you're coming towards me. You're trotting. I always start the pattern this way for those of you watching because it's a little bit easier to go from the slower movement, you know, the slower gait into the, the quicker gait. <clears throat> Coming this direction, the reason it's harder is that if the impulsion you generate from these poles causes the horse to want to lose his balance and fall on the forehand, you're going to like run him into these poles before you're able to make your downward transition. So it's a little bit trickier coming this. There we go. You eat that out there, Crystal. Good. This is a short gap. Now you can play around with how big you make this gap. We have this at about 15 feet here, which is pretty challenging. But you know, if you have a big arena, you can set at home. You can you can make this gap bigger if you wish to. Nice and straight and walk. Good girl. Good walk. Yeah. Nice. Really nice. I like the changes I'm seeing in that horse there, Lexi. Like, Whoops, wah, wah, wah. And our halfling, our friend, shows us why this is trickier, this setup here. For that reason, that's why I did not raise these walk poles off the ground. Ordinarily, I might do that. <coughs> but just because I don't want these horses like plowing into those poles, making that downward transition into a walk. So here we go. One, two. Good. And then that's right, you're going to keep trotting over these. Now you should only get two steps between in, in this blank space as well, okay? So now we're really kind of interrupting any patterns that might be in the horse's body because we're asking him to go, nice, good. We're asking him to go one step, two steps, two steps, one step, one, two. Whoop! A little too big in that stride, right? So we have beautiful almost trot extension going here, but then that horse didn't rebalance itself for the last gap of pulls. Good, just one step, one, two, one, there we go, good, sorry, you want two steps here. So putting gaps in your poles, if you kind of routinely ride over them in a sequence like this, is really good for integrating the changes that you want to make, because the horse is accountable for his own balance in that gap, you don't have the poles measuring out his stride. That was a little bit better, Emma. He's, you know, he commonly, he, he does what many horses commonly do, which is over ground poles and kind of pick up steam <laughs> as they're going. And we have to show them, uh, no, 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 we're not just gaining steam here. One, two, steady, steady, one, two, and one. Yeah, just like that. Good. 
force in the body. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. We're going to go through twice that way. Two times with each rider, just riding this corner, keeping that rhythm as far into the corner as possible. One, two, bend, 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 bend. Good. Whoop. Now feel her wanting to kind of fall away from this rail as you came out of the corner. Really try to hold that line. Okay, that's her getting a little stiff in that too. So you want to bend deeply through the corner, but then you got to go straight again. <clears throat> so I call this exercise shoulder in prep because you are preparing for just that shoulder in. We're, right here we're just ensuring that these riders can keep the same rhythm of the walk. Basically they don't come into this corner and then slow down. Good. And then what you're going to do starting with Emma who led us off. This time you're going to come through the corner and then you're going to rotate your upper body and ask the horse's forehand to come over onto its own track and ride a couple steps of shoulder in along this pole. This pole is here so that you don't migrate away from me. You're keeping the rhythm, you're riding into that corner. And one, two, three, four, one. Good. So sometimes I get asked, well, can't I just set this up in the corner of your arena? Yes, if that's the only way you're going to do it, for sure. Here's the difference though in my world is when you have the rail of the arena, let's, let me just help you for a second, Lexi, like, stop here. When you have the rail of the arena, the horse is kind of using that as a guideline. When you just have the poles, it helps riders find their outside leg a little bit better. So that's why I like this for introducing shoulder in. So go ahead and let's just ask for shoulder in out here. So you two riders can carry on with the exercise. I just want to help Lexi here for a second. So uh, just start her to walk. Let's head towards that end of the arena. And I want to see how much pressure that you're using with your inside leg so we're on the same page here. So let's just ask for the shoulder in as you would if you were out of your arm. Yeah, a little bit more quick with your rhythm. So it's left, release, left, release, left. In time with that stride, left, release. There, like that. You only want to use your leg when your left hind is coming forward because that's the only time she can step on her. So I want your rhythm with this leg to be time with his leg. So now let go. Now let go. There. Come out of the corner like a, a barge wandering around. And then starting with Emma, let's develop the shoulder in step. So now those of you sitting on this side of the arena will begin to see the horse's forehand should come over on its own track. Whew, good thing that pole was there, right? We saw that horse starting to drift towards me. There you go. Good. So Emma rode into the corner and the horse went, I don't really know if I'm going to use my hind end here, and just started drifting this way because of that. And the pole was there and the horse, you can kind of see the horse recalibrate. So again, that's why we put those, that's why we set them down. Keep the rhythm. A little bit more energy crystal. There you go. So nice and tall. Rotate your shoulders to the right. There you go. There you go. He goes, no, I don't want to step on my right hind. Yeah? Yeah? No, that, and, and that's really important. So that tells you, uh, Crystal, next time you ride behind a cone, try to get a little bit more of yourself on the right side of the saddle, okay? A little bit more on the right side. You're gonna wait a little bit more on this side so that he can't push you off that much that he did that time. In time to the stride, I'll call it out for you, Lexi. Right leg, right leg, right leg. Oh, oh, that's okay. So that timing with your leg with the shoulder in is, is, is really important there. Okay, so start this a little bit on the right butt cheek. Now use your right leg. Nudge, 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 nudge. There we go. So this side should feel pretty different than the other direction, right? Really different. So what does that tell you? He uses his hind leg really differently, yeah? Now if you just watch this horse trot around, it's not that evident that one hind leg is so different unless you're like really laser focused on it. You start doing these exercises and you're like, wow, this is a whole different horse on this side. Okay? <laughs> so again, it comes back to rhythm. That's the first piece. One, two, three, four. No matter how much degree of angle you're able to get in the shoulder, it doesn't matter right now. Keep the rhythm, keep the rhythm, keep the rhythm. Better that time. Better. We're still not at shoulder in, but it wasn't fish down with his haunches to the inside. Okay? So we're getting there. But again, you want to keep things short and sweet with any of these exercises. I always say treat an exercise like an interval. Um, an interval is going to be as short as 10 seconds. And you're getting value. You're getting um, the correct amount of muscle contraction to make a change based on the science that I've seen. 
So let's go ahead and set up the next pattern. And riders, we're going to move on to now riding over poles. So I'm just going to have my ground crew scatter some about here, and I'll explain what we're going to do with these. <clears throat> now, when we ride over poles, we the ground, and we collapse our hip, and we kind of override the horse. And this exercise I find to be really beneficial because as you ride along this pole, people tend to just sit up more, and they don't collapse and drop their shoulder and override the horse. So from it's kind of a sneaky exercise to get the rider performing the bend better. So let's just watch the, I want to see you apply a little bit more inside leg. And with him, I think it would be like a steady pressure. You know what I mean by that? Like maybe one or two pounds of pressure right at the front of the rib cage. Yeah, not bad, but still not bad. You feel how he gets a little tense when you bend. Yeah, like that, like that, like that. They're trying to stare the pole, look up. Breath, are you breathing? Good. Good. And you need to go a little bit more sideways with this guy. Yeah, yeah. So, <clears throat> carry on with him. So what we see with Lexi's horse is um, mixed results. Feel will get better as we go. But here's what I'm seeing is when you cue him, and you're doing it correct, him, right, or her? Her, sorry, sorry, her. When you cue her and you're doing that correctly, at first there's like a rigidity and there's no response. What it looks like to me, she's kind of like, I'm not going sideways. And then she does go sideways, she takes a good step, but then she goes, you know, I'm a little stiff. How about I just bend my neck? Do you feel that? Instead of cross my legs over. So let's just do it a few more times and see if you can just really hit your targets. And the reason I like exercises like this, instead of telling you, Lexi, like, well, just go leg heel that horse all the way across the arena. It's because she tells us, I'm a little stiff, and that's fair enough, and I'm going to find a compromised way to do this leg heel, and we don't want to train that happening into her, right? We don't want to push her so much she starts compromising. Yeah, that was good. Now straight. See, she's starting to get all crooked in her neck, but you have to go straight because you're at the pole, and that fixes the overbending in the neck. That was a good practice. Keep going sideways, 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 and then you go straight. So basically, the poles help you interrupt the sideways movement before it gets all wonky and, and crooked. Yeah, you see how she starts to go crooked, sorry, he starts to go crooked, and the shoulder starts to want to too much, right? But the pole catches you. See how helpful that is? Now straight, straight, straight. Don't worry, don't worry. That's what the poles are there for. They correct the horse on your own. So this exercise is so handy for leg yield in my, in my opinion. Keep your rhythm, don't slow down, don't slow down. One, two, three, four. Yeah, keep that rhythm now. Good. Now I'm going to make the spacing just a little bit wider so that we can do this in the jog riders. Now obviously on your own at home you would set this up to do in both directions or you would have a handy ground staff do that for you. Um, in the interest of time, we're just going to do it this one direction in this demo um, in the interest of time. But and obviously when you go home on your own, you would do it both directions. Now, riders, you can do this in the sitting trot or the posting trot. I always tell riders, however you feel like you're going to be most effective. So, so to the last target, but it's better to keep the rhythm, right? You kind of know where you're going. We've got the pole set up, but in his case, and I really don't want him to learn to slow down because that becomes pretty ingrained in there when you start doing any kind of um, moving them laterally or moving them to the side. <clears throat> so a little bit more weight in the left side. Let's see if we move them away from that. Move her away. There. There you go. Good. 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 Okay, let's do this a couple more times, each rider. Good. Like, I'm kind of rigid there, 
I can give here though, and, and but we don't want that. That's not going to resolve the problem, you know. So these polls are helpful for saying, whoop, now get straight, now get straight. Good. Great, Crystal. Yeah, there you go. Try to look up, sit up nice and straight yourself. Remember that, remember when we started with the serpentine poles, the whole idea there was to keep the rider nice and organized in the saddle. Yeah. Good. Good. So again, this is a simple one to set up at home. The one, the way I space these to start is to go five feet forward and then five feet to the side with the poles and drop a pole and then go five feet forward and five feet to the side. And then Nice job, uh huh? Good. So that got more balanced as we went. The reason I say that is this horse started to stay um, confident in, in her, his posture instead of pulling the neck in too much and without um, stepping on the pole, without losing the rhythm. Everything just got better. So along those lines, we're going to set up another um, exercise. But let's go ahead and change the formation. This next exercise is. You're gonna to plan to get your horse in a walk as you enter the chute, and then walk through the chute, and then pick up your working trot again. And what this does for riders, who's drifting to the left, yeah? And what this does for riders, as I was saying, is it highlights if your horse is crooked, and not so crooked that he's like running me over over here, but he's crooked in the sense that you're kind of trotting or gating along and he's just leaning on one direction. You know, he's like your car is kind of pulling one direction. When you throw in that uh, transition between gates and then, um, yeah, perfect, Emma, you can just kind of turn and ride that same sequence again and riders behind her can follow. When you throw in that, that transition between gates, you're asking him, whoop, and, and it helps riders be good with their timing. So it makes you pay attention and plan ahead a little bit to set the transition up. I want you in a walk by the time you step into that chute, okay? And when you get, well, I find when I give riders little tasks like this, like you have this, this clear marker, this clear goal you have to get to, it keeps them from micromanaging and it can keep things from getting too complicated and overthinking things. Or, I'm a dressage rider, so sometimes we're waiting so long for something to be perfect that we're, we never really get to the exercise we intend to do because things aren't getting perfect. You can still ask him a little bit sooner for that walk so that you're in it by the time you get there, Emma. This exercise, it's like if you're overthinking that down transition, you're gonna totally miss the walk. You're gonna, you're gonna blast on through that shoot before you're in the walk. Good job, Crystal, super, good. So again, this exercise, we're talking about straightness. Is your horse straight or is he leaning on one shoulder, drifting one? That was better. That was nice and straight, Lexi. Good. You're going to know if he's not straight if you end up like hugging this pole or that po or stepping on the pole. And for that reason, I set up this chute pretty narrow. This is about two and a half feet wide. Um, I do that on purpose so riders really have to be accountable. I like this for creating straightness more than just telling this rider, hey, good, that was smoother, yeah. So I like this better than telling the rider, hey, your horse is leaning to the left or drifting, you can push him more with your leg or do this with your rein. I like them just to use this visual, use this box, and get things fixed. So that time is not as straight, yeah? I just feel that, you do more to the left. So we'll ride one, one more time through here with like, yeah, better timing, Emma, good job, good. And then riders, um, for those of you that are ready, what you're going to do, if you want to stick with the trot to walk transition, I want you to do that. If you're ready, what you're going to do is trot up to the pole, and then as you enter the chute, you're going to pick up.